Welcome to this Warwick Medical School video on how to use the ophthalmoscope and the ophthalmoscope trainer. This is a very important tool for uh, your clinical skills, which honestly a lot of people do shy away from uh, because it can be somewhat challenging. But we're going to run through how to use it and hopefully uh, dispel some of those worries for you. So with regard to the ophthalmoscope, the first thing we need to do is understand how it works. We've got the switch on the bottom which brings on our light. We've got a rotary dial on the front which will change the appearance of the light that is projected through. So we've got a large a diameter uh, circle, a small diameter circle, a half um, moon, a green coloration and a, a dimmer version. So we're going to use the large um, uh, uh, circle initially. On the sides of the ophthalmoscope, we have uh, another dial which correlates to a, uh, a number going through the, um, uh, the window here. This relates to the lens uh, uh, that's currently being uh, displayed through the ophthalmoscope. And my recommendation with regards to starting off is take your glasses off if you've got them, focus on your fingertip we're going to change the lenses to bring the um, fingertip into focus and this is about a hand's breadth away. Once we've got the correct focal point then we're going to proceed to look at the eye. In terms of approaching the patient we want to make sure that we don't get too close so what I mean by that is my right eye is going to look at the patient's right eye so that, that way we are crossing over. My left eye would look at the patient's left eye. If we um, literally take the head my right eye to right eye, everything is fine. Left eye to left eye, everything is fine. Now, I actually have a problem with my right eye, so I have to uh, use my left eye more often, um, in which case it would be something that I'd highlight to the patient that I'm going to have to use an opposite eye when doing it because it will bring me that little bit closer to the patient. But obviously that's a very niche case. To start off, we're going to look at a distance uh, directly into the patient's eye with the light on. What we're looking for at this point is do we have uh, an intact red reflex and we're going to check one side and the other. Coming closer to the patient, we're then going to check the uh, pupil response to light. We want to shine the light in each eye. We're looking for the pupils to be equal and reactive to light. When we shine light in one eye, we want to make sure that there is a change in the contralateral eye as well. So we're demonstrating both cranial nerve two and three are intact because we have a direct light reflex and we've also confirmed the consensual light reflex in the opposite side. Carrying on further, we're going to put our hand on the patient's forehead, again using the right eye to the right eye and bringing in from the side. The benefit of putting the hand on the patient's forehead is it means we're unlikely to bang heads and we're going to actually just bang onto our hand instead. So once we've checked uh, for the pupil responses, we're going to look around the lid margins, looking for any crusting, any signs of conjunctivitis, looking for any problems with um, styes or myobian gland dysfunction, and seeing if there's any issues with the eyelids, at which point there were then going to have a look at the sclera, the white of the eye, and also looking around the pupil. Does the pupil appear regular in size? So is it circular all the way around? Or have we got an irregularity of the pupil, as we might see if somebody has had uh, injuries to the eye, perhaps? So when we actually start looking in the eye, we want to try and find the uh, blood vessels on the retina and follow those uh, blood vessels back to the optic disc. And then we want to give a comment to the optic disc. Once we've uh, looked at the blood vessels in the optic disc, we want to actually look around the eye, scanning around the retina uh, to give a comment as to the underlying um, appearance of the retina. Is it pale? Is it red? Can we see um, hemorrhages? Can we see exudates? Can we see uh, cotton wool spots? And in order to do that, we're going to ask the patient to look up, down, left and right. We're going to be shining the ophthalmoscope around to try and cover all of those quadrants. Once we've actually been able to establish the background um, appearance, we actually want to go into more detail about discussing what we can see, and we're going to go through some examples of that now. 
So for the first uh, retina that we have in the training suite here, you can see there are normal blood vessels leading up to the fundus. We've got um, a normal appearance with regard to color of the fundus. There's no evidence of abnormal cupping. And across the, um, the, the redness of uh, the retina, we've got no abnormal patches, no uh, bleeding, no aneurysms, no exudates, and no cotton wool spots. So we have a normal retina here. So here is an early stage uh, problem. This is uh, disc cupping. So we've got a mild um, change to the optic disc. And this is often associated with uh, glaucoma. However, as things progress, um, then that change is going to become much more pronounced and we may end up with a, uh, a change that might be seen with regard to optic atrophy over time. Here we've got an unfortunately common appearance. This is a hypertensive retinopathy. So we can see the retinal arteries are now narrowed and torturous, particularly on the outside of the retina. Um, and we can see on the sort of one o'clock position going towards uh, the optic disc, there's very narrow, torturous blood vessels. They really don't look healthy. Um, as things worsen, we can get hemorrhages. Um, there's one slight hemorrhage here to the uh, centre of the screen at the moment, uh, coming off that torturous blood vessel. Um, and we've also got some papilledema, some cupping at the optic disc. As things get very severe, we can see exudates. There's maybe a couple of little exudates at the seven o'clock position, and again, the one o'clock position out from the, um, the optic disc on the retina itself. These would tend to occur with papilledema and are commenting about pressure within the eye. So here we've got a series of slides with regard to diabetic retinopathy. Uh, this is incredibly important because it's something that we can actively prevent uh, by having good control of our diabetics. With regard to this, this is very much a mild appearance. So we've got some hemorrhages and microaneurysms. So in the top right of the image, we can see a, 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 an aneurysm, this sort of bleed occurring off one of the blood vessels. And we've got a, um, a couple of um, microaneurysms to the central part of the, um, the appearance, uh, the picture as well. Looking over the optic disc, everything there is uh, healthy and we don't have any uh, torturous blood vessels. However, along the uh, vessels are uh, some swellings um, at the conjunction with uh, the main blood vessel and its branches. So we can see these aneurysms that may go on to burst subsequently, causing flame hemorrhages on the retina. So we're progressing along the uh, diabetic retinopathy spectrum now. We have, here we have pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So again, we can see the hemorrhages, these sort of uh, flame-like appearances on uh, the retina. Uh, we can see um, uh, microaneurysms. So at the top and bottom of the image, we can see these soft uh, exudates. These are inflammation um, to the nerve sheaths and end up with these, well, literally cotton wool spot looking appearances due to nerve damage. So this is a very classic appearance. This is papilledema, and we're looking directly at the um, optic disc here. And can we see that it looks angry? It's swollen in appearance. And the normal classically um, maintained disc margin has disappeared here. Um, instead, we've got this sort of swollen, almost... It almost looks like a... Um, a a tomato soup, you know, pasta ring. It, it, this does not look as we've seen normally. And with regard, with regard to the blood vessels coming around, you know, these vessels look so much thicker. That, you know, more congested sort of worm-like. That, that extra blood going through them, all to do with papilledema. And it's worthwhile to look at the cause of papilledema, which are going to be raised intracranial pressure, um, tumours, things like that, that are going to cause this nasty, grumpy swelling here. So here we've got a very um, vivid appearance. So this is a central vet retinal vein occlusion and is often described as a stormy sunset appearance which is a wonderfully poetic phrase for such a, a terrible uh, event. So here there's obviously been a, 
an issue with the blood uh, coming out of the eye. And we ended up with these engorged veins, as you can see, at the one o'clock and five o'clock position, because obviously the, the, blood vo uh, the blood is not able to flow out of the uh, retina as it should be. Along the, ret uh, uh, along the retina itself, we can see these um, flame-shaped hemorrhages where we've got uh, bleeding occurring on the retina due to the increased pressure as a result of this blocked um, uh, central retinal vein. The next stage that we get with um, diabetic retinopathy, uh, we go to a background retinopathy. Here we can see these yellow appearances uh, in the middle of uh, the retina. Uh, so these are um, hard exudates. Um, and also, if we look directly over the macula, the macula has changed in its appearance. So we know that there are potential issues with uh, macular involvement here. So we can also see a couple of uh, hemorrhages in the bottom associated near the area of the, um, the hard exudates. So these hard exudates are um, areas of cholesterol deposition. So here we have a retina showing senar macular degeneration. We've got a, um, the disc itself on the left of the screen here is appearing normal. However, we can see that there's some change to the pigmentation to the macula in the center there. It looks quite dark. In addition, as we look around the, uh, the retina, uh, we can see some nodules, these dots that are across the, um, uh, the surface of the retina. There are, however, no changes to the blood vessels, and everything there looks nice and healthy with regard to the vasculature. Uh, there's no hemorrhages, there's no um, nipping, nor can we see any um, aneurysm-type appearances. So with diabetic retinopathy, because we're dealing with um, a degree of ischemia to the um, retina due to damage to the blood vessels from the sugar, we end up um, with um, extensive um, new blood vessel formation. As we can see, these sort of very thin, wispy blood vessels that have grown uh, across the eye. These can cause significant problems with blindness, potentially causing um, issues with the retina. And we can attempt to reduce these by um, looking at uh, laser surgery, potentially. And there are new injectables which can be provided to the eye. But by the, the mainstay of treatment would be, again, controlling uh, blood sugar and blood pressure and trying to prevent this occurring in the first place. Here's another classic um, problem affecting the optic disc. Uh, can we see that we've got a clear pallor to the optic disc? So this is optic um, atrophy, and it can be associated with this progressive loss of vision over time. Now, it can be due to many conditions, including glaucoma. So it's very important that we make sure we have our diabetic um, retinal screening. Um, it can also be due to problems with ischemia, so we might see it in combination with a central retinal vein occlusion, which we'll have a look at in a moment. But the, there are no other obvious changes to the retina, and the blood vessels here otherwise look healthy. To which end, here is a, uh, a diabetic retinopathy, which has been treated with uh, laser photocoagulation. So we've got this grid-shaped appearance of dots all the way around the retina, attempting to spare the macula, um, the darker area towards the center, but with the aim of trying to prevent uh, worsening to uh, the blood vessels in terms of new blood vessel growth. Well, I hope that's been a useful overview on how to use the ophthalmoscope and hopefully it has taken away some of the fear with using this very useful uh, device. Take care and we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.